Funding for this program was provided in part by Religious Education at Brigham Young University. This address by Dr. Susan Easton Black was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 28, 2005. Hello, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you. My topic tonight will be Joseph Smith, June 27, 1844. This day in history holds great meaning for Latter-day Saints, throughout the world. The reason it holds great meaning is because it was the date on which the prophet Joseph Smith, who is 38 and a half years old, and his brother Hiram, who is age 44, were shot in Carthage jail. We are very privileged to know some details of the last hours of their life. We don't know the details of many of the religious martyrs where we could actually give the day, time, and event as it led to their death. But in the case of Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram, we are able to do so. In fact, we can do the last 12 hours of their lives. I begin now with June 27, 1844, at 5 a.m. in the morning. At 5 a.m. in the morning, they have visitors, Joseph and Hiram, are in Carthage jail and have spent the night. At 5 a.m. coming to see the prophet will be John P. Green. John P. Green was a sheriff in Nauvoo. Accompanying him will be W.W. W. Phelps. W.W. W. Phelps is well known in the church as a man that wrote the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. After the death of the prophet Joseph Smith, he will write praise to the man which will be then part of the funeral eulogy for the prophet there after his death. These two men now stopped by the jail. They wanted to stop by to see the prophet Joseph and his brother Hiram before they left to go to beautiful Nauvoo. At 5.30 a.m., Joseph Smith will ask a friend and partner in a steamboat business called the Maid of Iowa, a man named Dan Jones, to inquire of the guards as to the cause of the disturbance in the night before. Dan Jones will now leave the jail as he did so. He heard a man whose name was Frank Worrell, an officer of the guard. What he heard him say was, we have had too much trouble to bring old Joe here to let him ever escape. He talked about himself, meaning Frank, prophesying better than Joseph. He said, no one who remains with him will see sunset today. In other words, as early as 5.30 a.m., at least one saint, Dan Jones, a man who will live to be a great missionary to the British Isles, particularly Wales, will now know that there is a guard who is now boasting on the streets that no one who remains with the prophet Joseph or patriarch Hiram in Carthage jail will see sunset. Dan immediately returned with the news to the jail. When Joseph heard it, he told Dan Jones to leave the jail once again, this time to go and tell the governor. The governor, whose name was Thomas Ford, had taken up his residence in a place called the Hamilton Hotel there in Carthage. It wasn't very far from the jail, and so Dan Jones now hurries on. As he hurries on, he hears a leader of the militia say as he's passing by the town square, our troops will be discharged this morning in obedience to orders, and for a sham we will leave town, but we'll return when the governor leaves and kill the man if we have to tear the jail down. Three cheers were heard. Jones now hurries on to tell the governor there in the Hamilton Hotel exactly what he has heard, what he has heard from Frank Worrell, what he has heard as he has now passed 
the area then uh, near the city square. The governor's comment, you are unnecessarily alarmed for the safety of your friends. At 7 a.m. on June 27th, Joseph Smith has breakfast along with his brother Hiram. By 8 a.m., he is requesting that there be passes given for his friends so that they will be able to visit him and his brother in the jail unmolested. At 8 a.m., following this 8 a.m. experience, at 8.20, Joseph will write to Emma, his wife, who's back in Nauvoo, 23 miles away. In the letter, he will say several things, including, if the governor does come with troops, you will be protected. You need not be afraid of the danger of some extermination order. He will then add a postscript that becomes very famous in Latter-day Saint literature. The postscript, or PS, reads, We are very much resigned to our lot, knowing I am justified and have done the best that could be done. By 9.40 a.m., Joseph now has several of his attorneys that will come to the jail. Among them will be a man named James Woods from Iowa. James Woods was actually a very lackluster attorney, but in this occasion, he was literally better than his best. He had interacted with militia, with the governor, and was now then speaking with the prophet at the jail. As Joseph now interacts with James Woods and other attorneys, Governor Ford leaves town. He's leaving town with his troops as they now leave Carthage en route to Nauvoo. Just before he leaves, he now says to those who are members of the Carthage Grays, a militia unit who but two days before were put under arrest for insulting the commanding general. He now puts them in charge of assisting near the jail. It will be at this time that Thomas Ford, the governor, is heard to say, I was never in such a dilemma in my life. It's interesting about the same time that Governor Ford is expressing the dilemma he now faces. Joseph and Hiram are bearing a faithful testimony to the work of the latter days there in the jail. They're also bearing testimony of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, then the keystone of our religion. They are also prophesying at this time of the triumph of the gospel over all the earth. At 11 a.m., some of Joseph's friends and his attorneys now leave from the jail. They leave Carthage and, like Governor Ford, they now head towards Nauvoo. Their purpose is not the same as Governor Ford's. Their purpose is to gather witnesses for the forthcoming trial. The trial then would be twofold. One, Joseph and Hiram are accused of starting a riot on the streets of Nauvoo as it relates to the Nauvoo Expositor. Both men are also charged with treason against the United States. At 11.30 a.m., coming to visit the prophet, will be a man whose name is Alma W. Babbitt. Alma W. Babbitt is a most unusual man in church history. He's been a stake president in Kirtland. At this time, he is serving as a branch president out in a little community called Ramus, Illinois. A man that was sent to send word to Alma W. Babbitt was a man named Uncle John Smith, the patriarch. Uncle John Smith had ridden to Ramus to be able to speak to Brother Babbitt. The purpose of his speaking was to ask him if he would be willing to be Joseph's attorney here in the forthcoming case. In other words, Joseph is, is amassing together a large legal team. Alma W. Babbitt at that point had said, Uncle John, you are too late. I've already been hired by the other side. But the interesting thing is that the next day, he now does show up at the jail at 1130. When he comes, he has with him a letter from Oliver Cowdery, a man that had been the scribe to most of the Book of Mormon, 
a man that had been with the prophet Joseph when the Aaronic priesthood was restored on, uh, in May of 1829, a man that had been with him when the Melchizedek priesthood was restored by Peter, James, and John, and also the very same man that had been with him on April 3rd of 1836 when Elijah, Elias, and Moses had brought additional priesthood keys. By 1220, Joseph Smith is writing to another attorney. This time, he's writing to an attorney whose name is Browning. Browning lives in a place called Quincy, Illinois. Browning had been a friend of the saints when they first crossed from Missouri, uh, crossing then the Mississippi River, seeking safety after the extermination order and having, be, having been driven from the state. As Joseph now writes to this attorney in Quincy, he wants to ask him, will he consider being his attorney also? In the letter that he writes, he says to Browning that he and his brother Hiram are charged with treason, but they are not guilty. By 115, as we now look at some of the highlights of this day, Joseph, Hiram, Willard, Richards will dine in their room. 15 minutes later, by 1.30, Willard Richards is feeling ill. By 3.15, John Taylor has now joined them in the bedroom then on the second floor. At 3.15, John Taylor will be asked to sing. Why was he asked to sing as opposed to anyone else in the room? One reason, perhaps, is he has a beautiful tenor voice. For John Taylor, years later, while serving as president of the church, he will have different occasions in which people will come seeking counseling, such as men concerned over a water rights issue. He will always start his counseling sessions with a verse from a hymn. His belief was that uh, Song of the Heart could obviously temper any kind of situation that's going on. John Taylor will sing a song that's becoming very popular in other churches as well as our own in Illinois at that time. It is a poor wayfaring man of grief. It will be the prophet Joseph Smith who will request that he sing it a second time. Following this, Hiram Smith will read extracts from Josephus. Josephus was a great Jewish historian who wrote um, about the history of that area. By 4, 4 p.m., the guard will change outside of Carthage jail, leaving only eight Carthage Greys, then the military unit, to remain. The rest have now gone to the town square. In other words, they have deserted their post. By 4.15, Joseph will have an occasion to converse with the remaining guards about apostates. He will particularly uh, focus on three. One is Joseph Jackson. Another one is William Law. William Law had been a member of the First Presidency of the Church. Another will be William Law's brother, a man named Wilson Law, who will be serving as the Major General of the Nauvoo Legion. By 5 p.m., the jailer announces that it will be safer for the prisoners to now head up into the sale portion of the home. Joseph Smith will turn to Willard Richards. He will ask him, if I go into the sale, will you go with me? Willard's comment was, Joseph, you didn't ask me to go to Iowa with you. You didn't ask me to come here to Carthage. But if you are found guilty of treason, I will be hung in your stead. Joseph says you will not. And with this, Willard then moves his way up the stairs. He will be followed by John, by Hiram, and by the prophet Joseph. Near 5 p.m., they begin hearing a sound of rustling outside of the jail door, a cry of surrender, and a discharge of firearms. John Taylor describes this scene years later. Around five o'clock in the afternoon, an armed mob painted black 
This paint that the mob has placed on themselves is a mixture of gunpowder and water. The mob is described by Brother Taylor as being from 150 to 200 persons that have surrounded the jail. Despite early attempts to protect themselves from the mob violence, the four men in the room, John Taylor, Willard Richards, Joseph Smith, and Hiram Smith, could not stop the efforts of the mob. Hiram Smith will be the first to fall from an assassin's bullet. While pushing against the main door of the jail, then leading into the bedroom, a bullet that will be shot through will hit in his nose. Hiram Smith will then fall back from the door from the assassin's bullet. As he falls to the ground, his last words are, I am a dead man. Upon seeing him fall, Joseph Smith will sob, Oh dear brother Hiram. In the meantime, John Taylor will attempt to cross the room. While he crosses the room, four bullets will hit him. However, he is able to climb up onto the window sill. As he climbs up on the window sill, he is attempting to jump out to go get help for those that are now targets of the assassins. John Taylor, while attempting to go out of the window, a bullet then aimed for his heart will hit his watch, and John Taylor is now thrust back into the room and uh, pushes himself under the bed. The next man we now turn to is the prophet Joseph. Joseph now begins to move towards the east window. As he did so, bullets shot from the doorway struck him, as did two shot from outside. He will fall from the window in the room to the ground below after exclaiming, O oh Lord my God. The workers of destruction left more than the corpses of two men on June 27, 1844. They left a broad seal affixed to Mormonism that cannot be rejected by any court on earth and truth of the everlasting gospel that all the world cannot impeach. They left two martyrs' crowns that they helped forge with their senseless brutality. Many have tried to explain the 12 hours of events that we have talked about in brief that have occurred on June 27th. As they have done so, they have tried to explain why were the brothers shot. One that is often heard in historical circles was it had everything to do with Thomas Ford, the governor. Thomas Ford had promised Joseph Smith, while Joseph was also staying there in the Hamilton Hotel, that he would not leave town without him. Joseph believed that his life would be safe as long as the governor stayed in town. In other words, mobs would not rule. But in this case, Governor Ford had turned his back on Joseph and his brother in their hour of need. The promise that he had made he had broken. Years later, it's obvious that Governor Ford worried about this. Remember, he had said that never was he in such a dilemma in his life. Years later, he wrote his version of the history of Illinois. In his version of the history of Illinois, he wrote of his three great fears. One fear was he worried that someone would speak of Joseph Smith and then the name of Joseph Smith would go far and wide. He also worried that there would be place names such as Carthage and other places like Palmyra that would be as common to people throughout the world as were such names as Bethlehem and Gethsemane. He also worried in his history of the church that there might be someone who might link his name to such infamous characters that had lived in the past as such people as Pontius Pilate and Herod. So some claim that it was Governor Ford, that the reason Joseph died had everything to do with Governor Ford. Others say, well, Ford had a hand in it, all right, but without the apostates. 
Joseph had said earlier, when asked, are you fearful about all your enemies that are now gathering towards Carthage? Are you fearful for your life because of them? His comment was, is that his life was of more danger from some fool in this town, meaning Nauvoo, than from his enemies in Carthage. Who were those fools in town that literally turned their heel on Joseph? Well, you've got William Law, his brother Wilson Law. You've got Joseph Jackson that Joseph Smith is talking about even on June 27th to the very guards. You also have the Higby brothers. You have a doctor in Nauvoo named Robert Foster, to name a few. Others say the scene in Carthage would never have happened on that June 27th, 1844, if it had not been for the destruction of a newspaper in Nauvoo called the Nauvoo Expositor. Well, there's no question on June 7, 1844, there was a newspaper that was printed right there on Mulholland Street in Nauvoo. It was printed by the apostates. In this newspaper, they announced horrible things about the prophet Joseph. They also announced horrible things about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in general. They also demanded a repeal of the Nauvoo City Charter. It was Joseph Smith in his office as mayor. Hiram Smith, there is part of the city council that will, after due deliberation, make the decision that this newspaper should be stopped. Was it the newspaper and the subsequent effect of the destruction that will occur then on June 10th of 1844? Is that what led to the death of Joseph and Hiram? Others suggest, no, it was a whole bunch more than Governor Ford, apostates, even Nauvoo Expositor. It had everything to do with the Carthage Graves. The Carthage Graves, a militia unit, they should have been on top of it. They were actually um, men that should have known better. They had an assignment. They were to protect those who were in the jail. They left their duty at 4 o'clock. By 5.15, Joseph is dead. They knew of the threats. In fact, some of those who were in the Carthage Grays, including a Frank Worrell, had uh, literally announced he could prophesy and had announced that those who were in the jail would not see sunset. In fact, some of the Carthage Grays were among those who had blackened their faces with a type of black paint a mixture of gunpowder and water. Others say, no, the reason that Joseph and Hiram were killed had more to do than just Governor Ford, apostates, expositor, the Carthage Grays. It had everything to do with Joseph Smith calling out the Nauvoo Legion on June 18th of 1844. There's no question Joseph acting in his office as Lieutenant General did call out the Nauvoo Legion to protect the town. But was that the reason? Was that the reason for the charge of treason? Others claim, no, you need to trace it farther back. You should go back to a man whose name was Thomas Sharp. Thomas Sharp was a young man. He's in his 20s, actually early 20s. He was an editor of a newspaper called the Warsaw Signal. He'd been calling, using his right as an editor, in the signal for the extermination of the Mormons and for a war on Nauvoo. Truly, it must have been him as a reason that Joseph was killed. Some say, no, you're not going back far enough. It's not Thomas Sharp. It's not Thomas Ford. It's not the Nauvoo Legion and the calling out. It's not the Nauvoo Expositor, the Carthage Grays, or the Apostates you could actually trace the seeds of it back to the time that Joseph is sharing with a minister in Palmyra about the truths he has learned in the first vision. And then you trace it forward from there. We can identify that a man, someone, attempted to shoot Joseph in Palmyra. We can also look at March 24, 1832, 
and speak about the tarring and feathering of the prophet. Or we could talk about uh, Samuel Lucas and an order to have Joseph shot there in far west at the town square. Now you realize each of these reasons as to why it happens, they're plausible. You could actually build a case for each one. But then comes something so different. It's attributed to John Taylor. John Taylor left the answer as to why the men were killed. It is found in the first verse of section 135. To seal the testimony of this book, meaning the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Book of Mormon, we announce the martyrdom of Joseph Smith the prophet and Hiram Smith the patriarch. If such a statement be true, it means that the lives of two men were required to seal the truthfulness of two books. It also means that it was not enough for Joseph Smith or Hiram Smith to advocate, preach from, or vocally testify of the truth of the words within the covers of the books. An ultimate sacrifice was required, that of martyr's blood. With that, then, was it worth it? We need to examine, then, the contents of these two books to determine, was it worth blood? Was it worth the blood of a man who was 38 years old, named Joseph Smith, or his brother, Hiram Smith, who was 44 on June 27, 1844? We now look at the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith said of this book, as we begin to open up its pages, as to why it would cost then the best blood of the 19th century. Joseph Smith said of the Book of Mormon, that it was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Latter-day Saint prophets, in addition to the prophet Joseph, have called it the keystone of our religion. The title page tells us of its purpose. It tells us that the Book of Mormon has a threefold purpose. One is to learn of what great things the Lord has done for our fathers. The second is to learn of the covenants of the Lord so that we will not be cast off forever. The third is to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. The question is, did the book fulfill the goals? In other words, the goals are expansive, they're wonderful, they're worth a life, if not two. Did the book fulfill the goals? My answer is yes, in the first one, to learn of what great things the Lord has done for our fathers. The Book of Mormon covers a time period in the Americas that spans from 600 B.C. to 421 A.D. In addition, the Book of Ether tells of a more ancient time. As you look at this time period, it does tell the great things that the Lord has done for these wonderful people that lived in times past. It tells that he has sent prophets. It tells of a liahona. It tells of a church organization. It tells of the coming of the Savior. Second, this book, the title page tells us that we are to learn of the covenants of the Lord, to learn that we are not cast, cast off forever. The book speaks often of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of the covenants, the covenant of sacrament, the covenant of baptism, of the importance of having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Third, the Book of Mormon tells Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is the great I Am. Prophetic scribes of the Book of Mormon wrote about the earthly existence of the Savior before his birth. They wrote of his coming to the earth, of his eternal father, of his mortal mother. They wrote of his baptism, of his ministry, of his disciples, of his atonement, of his suffering and death, 
and also of his resurrection. The Book of Mormon writers wrote some form of Christ's name on an average of every 1.7 verses. They literally wrote another testament of Jesus Christ. They referred to Jesus Christ by 101 different names, from the first reference to him as Lord, found in 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 1, to the final name in the Book of Mormon given him as eternal judge in Moroni 10.34. What is the Book of Mormon? The Book of Mormon, then, is an irrefutable testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is clearly the central focus of the book. What, then, was worth a life? I've written books. None of my books are worth a life. They're worth my lifetime to write, but they're not worth a martyr's blood. The Book of Mormon is different. The Book of Mormon was worth the life of two then of the best men of the 19th century, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith. What can you find in its contents? You can learn then of the great things the Lord has done for our fathers and those who have lived upon this land. You can learn about covenants in this book. You can learn that Jesus is the Christ and that we are not cast off forever. Is that worth a martyr's blood? I say yes. We now look at the Doctrine and Covenants. The Doctrine and Covenants is dramatically different than the Book of Mormon. The Doctrine and Covenants, notice, uh, well, it's naming. It's going to be about the doctrine, in other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's also going to be about covenants, but in what ways is it different? How it is different is, one, it's not a translation. In other words, it, it represents revelations giving to prophets, especially the prophet Joseph Smith. It's a standard work. It also is divided into sections. Some have suggested that the Doctrine and Covenants are revelations given to individuals. To some extent, they are right. They cover revelations in which you can find 130 contemporaries of the Prophet Joseph Smith name by name. 128 of them are male and two are females. The oldest man mentioned by name is a man named Daniel Miles at age 29. He's in the first quorum of the 70. The youngest mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants are Joseph Smith and Heman Bassett, both men being 17 at the time of their revelations. The medium age of those mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants is 39. Some suggest that the Doctrine and Covenants talks about priesthood callings. It also talks about who will be presiding over the Melchizedek priesthood. Third, it talks about who's been ordained to the priesthood, and fourth, who's being reprimanded. But in the explanatory introduction of the Doctrine of Covenants, much like the title page of the Book of Mormon, is an explanation as to what this book is to be. The book is called the capstone of our religion. In other words, the Book of Mormon is a keystone this is the capstone. This is the last. The introduction claims that it is a collection of divine revelations and inspired declarations given for the establishment and regulation of the kingdom of God on the earth in the last days. The Doctrine and Covenants then becomes very unique. The explanation then tells us that within these pages there will be information to help us prepare for the second coming of the Savior. Throughout this book, you can find sprinkled such statements as, What I, the Lord, have decreed in them shall be fulfilled. You will also find, Prepare ye, prepare ye, for that which is to come, for the Lord is nigh. In looking at the names given in the Doctrine and Covenants for Jesus Christ, there is something then in my mind that made this book stand out 
The difference that I found between this book and the doctrine and the Book of Mormon goes like this. The Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. What I found in the Doctrine and Covenants is it is also a testament of Jesus Christ. You will notice then many names appear in the Doctrine and Covenants, like appear in the Book of Mormon, that indicate a reference to Jesus Christ. Outlined in red, you will see then names for Christ that appear in the Doctrine and Covenants that don't appear in the Book of Mormon. As you begin to look through these names, notice that they are names that bespeak a future event. What is the Doctrine and Covenants? The Doctrine and Covenants then prepares us is a Latter-day Scripture to prepare us for the Second Coming. A couple of examples. Notice you see Bridegroom. He is the Bridegroom. Uh, the virgins are waiting to get into the great feast. He is the eternal king. He will rule as uh, the Prince of Peace, Lord of Lord, and King of Kings. He is the God of Enoch. Notice you can't find that in the 101 names mentioned in the Book of Mormon. God of Enoch, meaning he is uh, the God of a people who will one day return. He is also the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the mighty God of Jacob, which has everything to do with covenants. He is the son Amon. He is the word. He is the stone of Israel. Now these names of Christ and the verses that then go with them begin to show something also most unusual in the Doctrine and Covenants, that it's my hope you'll want to read this as we prepare ourselves for the Second Coming. You'll discover in the Doctrine and Covenants that when the Lord speaks, he is very autobiographical. You don't have the same sense of the prophetic scribes that you have when uh, you get his words in the Book of Mormon. Not only is it autobiographical in nature, but it's messianic, meaning future-looking, future as opposed to the words in the Book of Mormon. It is easy to see that the Doctrine of Covenants is a capstone to the Restoration. For example, there are 18 clear references to a millennial reign. The Doctrine of Covenants also differs in what it speaks about. Notice what it speaks about. It speaks about Adam on Diamon, a place where Adam dwelt and then blessed his family. It speaks of ministering of angels. It speaks of an archangel. It speaks of baptisms for the dead, all topics not found in the Book of Mormon. Do you see how they are companion pieces? It speaks of bishop, bishopric, celestial glory, the Church of Enoch, Church of the Firstborn, of deacons, of endowment, exaltation, first presidency, baptismal font, general authorities, the Holy Spirit of promise, of keys, the law of consecration, of Michael, of the new and everlasting covenant, of patri patriarchs and patriarchal, of the president and presidency, of quorums, of recorders, of celestial glory, of terrestrial glory, united order, wards, and Zion. Now notice, when you put these together, what do you have? You have a keystone, you have a capstone, you have bookends. The question then becomes, was it worth it? Was it worth the lives of two men in conclusion, Ezra Taft Benson stated, the bringing forth of these sacred volumes of scripture for the salvation of a ruined world costs the best blood of the 19th century, that of Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram. Millions in the world today know that the martyrdom 
was much more than the result of mob brutality. Millions in the world today refuse to give credit to Thomas Ford for the martyrdom. Millions in the world today refuse to give credit to the apostates for the martyrdom or to the Nauvoo expositor. Millions in the world today refuse to give credit to the Carthage Grays or to Thomas Sharp. It would be too small of a gesture to give them credit because after all, what was the purpose of the martyrdom? To seal testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. The Book of Mormon today is now published in 105 languages with 49 translations in process. In other words, the Book of Mormon today is flooding the earth. The keystone has gone out. It is being carried by missionaries. It's being carried by members. It's being read. We have a prophet of God that's encouraged us to read the Book of Mormon again, read the keystone, know the foundation, know what we believe, know about God's great blessings that he gave to our fathers, know about the covenants, know of Jesus Christ. The Doctrine and Covenants is now published in 42 languages. These same missionaries are now carrying then the capstone. As they carry the capstone, they can now share with people eternal truths, eternal truths that will help them prepare for the second coming of the Savior. They can share with them what is celestial glory, what is an endowment, what is a baptismal font, what is the law of consecration? What is Zion? These books are the keystone and the capstone of the Latter-day Saint faith, for they witness that Jesus is the Christ. They are bookends. To me, was it worth the best blood of the 19th century, that of Joseph and Hiram Smith on the date of June 27th? 1844? I say yes. Why would I say yes? I will be forever grateful for the martyrs. Now you realize they did wonderful things in their lifetime. For Joseph Smith, he was worthy to see God the Father in Jesus Christ. They received the priesthood. They functioned in the priesthood and they honored the priesthood. But for these books, why am I so grateful? What it means for me is I have an opportunity in my life, now literally decades, 150 plus years later, to be able to read the words of God. What does June 27, 1844 mean to me? It means that two great men needed to do something very important for their Father in Heaven. They needed to do the ultimate sacrifice. They needed to give their lives, not because of any brutality of a mob or what a mob had thought or the governor or anybody else. They needed to give their lives to seal their testimony that the Doctrine and Covenants and the Book of Mormon both are the words of God. I say this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This address by Dr. Susan Easton Black was given at the Sidney B. Sperry Symposium at Brigham Young University on October 28, 2005.